Hello and welcome to the New Books Network. I'm Pierre Dalanza. Pablo Picasso is often credited with saying that good artists borrow, but great artists steal. How can we conceptualize artistic theft when it has a political dimension and takes an ideological position against the host? Anna Watkins Fisher, the author of The Play in the System, proposes thinking of a range of artistic practices as parasitical. Parasitism is a strategy of complicity that affects subversion from within hegemonic systems. Fisher tracks the ways in which artists on the margins have willfully abandoned the radical scripts of opposition and refusal long identified with anti-capitalism and feminism. Anna Watkins Fisher is a cultural and media theorist and an associate professor at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and I'm very happy that she joins me now. Anna, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Pierre. Thanks for having me. Anna, I can't tell you how excited I am to talk to you about your book. Your text is so uncannily close to my own research that I'm tempted to just submit it as my own PhD research and try to see if I can get <laughs> that. And that, I hope, will be a joke that becomes clear to our listeners in a moment. Before we get into the meat of the book, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your intellectual trajectory and how you got to the, the idea of parasitical resistance and and art attacking the system. Well, thank you for the introduction and for the threat. That is a compliment. <laughs> um, I'll take it. And maybe there'll be another book that'll come out of it. Um, <laughs> so I began thinking about these questions a really long time now um, ago um, as a graduate student um, and also as a someone who had come out of my, doing my undergrad and was really interested in the more kind of ambivalent strands of feminist kind of art and performance. But um, as I got kind of closer to what would be the final book form, really what was motivating the book was really trying to think about the possibilities of resistance in a moment in which resistance feels very shut down. It feels very naive. And I was really interested in the problem of co-option and how really I was seeing artists offering if not solutions, then certainly suggesting ways of still responding to this moment. So for me, there were kind of a set of political questions that were motivating it. And then really, I think I was doing what I often do, which is looking to artists to try to think through those questions and see what resources they're offering in their work. But just to kind of answer your question, yes, this was a book that came out of a PhD and sees the arc of my own kind of development someone who began more in a certain kind of contemporary art history and performance studies and was really moving into thinking about digital culture and kind of neoliberalism um, more broadly and um, attempting to um, bridge that um, through this um, kind of performance of politics I'm calling parasitism. Well, and bridge all those things you do, uh, which, which I think is a tremendous undertaking, before we start defining all the terms of parasitism and guest and host and so on, which have beautiful resonances throughout throughout the book, let's start with an example that maybe will come across as a little bit out of there in an art history book. You start your introduction by talking about a project entitled Amazon Noir, which I'm slightly embarrassed I didn't know about, which is essentially an attack at the Amazon bookstore which redistributed in in the vein of things like Uberweb or or Libgen or Sci-Hub, redistributed a lot of book material into the public domain. So maybe you could use that to describe a little bit the kind of arena in which we are. Sure, yeah. So in 2006, this tactical media collective called Uber Morgan um, essentially gained access to Amazon's digital library by capturing like 3,000 copy protected books that were sold on Amazon by manipulating the search inside the book feature that I think many of us use often and are mm-hmm. familiar with. You know, this is a marketing tool that enables users to search um, through books while also kind of preventing access to the whole book at the same time. So they, they did this by using software bots and they basically sent five to 10,000 requests per book and then reassembled them into PDFs that they then distributed for free by these peer-to-peer networks. And basically what the bots did was they tricked Amazon's preview mechanism into giving these complete volumes over. But for me, what's important about this is that they didn't hack Amazon's digital library, Mm. right? 
they acquired it through what they describe as a form of front door access. So they mm-hmm. didn't hack it because they used this public facing search mechanism. They just used it exponentially more than was intended by the site. Mm-hmm. And what interests me most in the book is what happens next, which is that Amazon then responded to Uber Morgan by threatening legal action. Um, and this is something that we see with artists across the, the book. This happens often. Um, and the case was settled out of court, ultimately, with Amazon buying Amazon Noir, the mm. software, for an undisclosed sum. And they made Uber Morgan sign a non-disclosure agreement, which is now common practice, right? Yeah. So what this did was it, it contained this disruption, this intervention, and they re- it restored the system as it had worked. And so while we, we may kind of say, oh, that this, this is a failing, this is a failed work, right? Ultimately, it failed to bring down Amazon. In the book, I'm interested in the way it did succeed or way of reading what it does actually do, which is reveal something about how Amazon works and how a lot of Hmm. companies work today, which is they maintain their dominance, but they also try to appear open. So they use these various techniques like non-disclosure agreements to um, essentially maintain the legal and moral high ground and positioning themselves as champions of openness while really functioning as monopolies. So I think the ingeniousness of that that work and what I talk about is that they make Amazon essentially buy their anti-capitalist artwork. Yeah. They make them be the patron of it. Um, and, the, and the work, even though it's kind of now closed and black box, there's something that that black box does tell us about the way that these companies work um, through that form of patronage. Yeah, and that's, that's a fascinating example because I think it takes us straight away into a couple of very interesting directions. So first of all, the thing that I picked out from your, your answer is that we're not thinking necessarily about hacking. We're not necessarily thinking about anything the like of illegal theft in this particular practice. And, I've, and I would argue with, in quite a lot of the practices that you look at in, in the book. But what I really was interested in is the framing that you, you bring out to this straight away from the title, which is to look at the idea of the artist as a parasite to look at the ideas of a host and a guest. And these are all terms that, of course, circulate quite widely in our conversations about the economy. Early on in the book, you have examples of corporations like Airbnb and Walmart and, and Uber as that employ some of the modes of thinking as part of the business plan. But you also shed light on the way that artistic practices have been able to render some of those conversations, some of those relationships into productive political mechanisms. So maybe for a bit of terminology, I could ask you to talk about what happens between the host and a guest, what happens between the parasite and and the host mechanism, and how how does it transfer from biology to art and to technology? Yeah, so let's maybe take this in parts. I can start with parasitical resistance which is in the subtitle of the book. So the book is called The Play in the System, The Art of Parasitical Resistance. And for me, parasitical resistance is essentially the interval between what the host is willing to give and what the parasite is able to get away with taking. So it's a kind of space for play that certain relatively privileged but still minor actors, and I can talk more about Mm. this, what seems kind of like a contradiction, but These are minor actors that still have certain kinds of privilege that they can activate um, and use. But it's that play that can be leveraged that has to do with the host's investment in appearing generous and open and caring. And for me, what's really important is that this is not a tactic that's equally available to all. Um, Mm -hmm. So like, you know, the example I just gave of Amazon um, or, you know, as you were saying, these many other companies that work in similar ways, these big tech companies or just kind of large conglomerates, they often function on a model of hospitality, I argue. Um, And this is within a kind of neoliberal framing of the project. So by that, I mean that they rely on performance of themselves, really, we could say, um, as a platform that promotes access, flexibility, and I'm also reading this onto other sorts of powerful entities not just digital tech companies, but also um, I have a chapter that looks at the state, the neoliberal state that purports and kind of positions itself as welcoming, but then can slam the door on refugees or people that it doesn't want to include. And then I think about um, toxic masculinity as, as doing some of the same things, certain kinds of figures that want to seem kind of open and progressive, 
but can then use their power in a similar way. So you seem to be introducing a whole range of power relationships that are not necessarily as unidirectional as we might have hoped. So I guess you're making some space for a fair bit of ambiguity here. So what I think that an example like what Amazon Noir is doing shows is it's highlighting how under neoliberalism power is gaining ground, not by necessarily always, and then we can talk about kind of the Trump era or the, the more fascistic kind of forms, but, but this particular kind of more soft power works by imposing constraints on citizens and users, not by kind of um, imposing them, but by in, inciting them to participate or buy in. Yeah. So it controls by presenting itself as eminently flexible, open and participatory, as I was saying. Now, for me, in the book, this is an opening. Um, it's a space precisely for that that potential parasitical resistance, because this performance of um, what I'm calling a coercive hospitality affords mm. a narrow opening and, and one that is not always there, but can be used um, when it is there for resistance, even though that resistance may be very compromised. And this is what I'm developing as parasitism. Well, let's dive into it. Who or what is the parasite? So the, the figure came to me as an answer to a problem I, I was really struggling with, um, which is the question of how to confront this certain kind of modality of power as it operates under neoliberal capitalism that I was describing, where it can have this happy face and it can seem to be kind of able to absorb anything you throw at it. So I was really kind of interested in the problem of how artists and specifically for me, how kind of feminist and anti-capitalist artists were enacting resistance when it seemed to be easily co-opted and commodified. Mm. So in the book, I'm examining how this kind of paradigm of parasitism, like is taken up by certain artists, really often artists kind of that we could describe as artists on the margins from the hacker, hacker collectives to kind of feminist writers and performers. So it's kind of a broad spectrum. And the parasite is a really helpful paradigm, I think, um, to try to understand the politics of this body of work, and particularly these kind of artists that are working in more experimental or marginal traditions. And artists who, for the most part for me in the book, have been viewed as um, by, suspiciously, often um, whose work has not been seen as very political in a, in a kind of mm. coherent way, um, and try to understand the highly ambivalent and ambiguous politics of this work and, and really yeah. trying to see that it holds more political potential than it's been granted. And so the parasite is interesting because it's an actor that can be traced back to ancient religious rites. So in early, um, in kind of the early origins of the, of the parasite, the parasite was someone who was invited um, in as a guest. So it was invited to dine at the table of the more powerful because it was seen as having a special kind of religious knowledge. So the parasite mm. was a kind of religious figure who knew, who knew like what grain to use and what religious rites. And because of mm. that, it had a special kind of social position, a kind of weird interstitial position. Um, so parasitos is beside the food or beside yeah. the grain. So essentially what you have in the parasite is a less powerful actor that is able to leverage a certain kind of know-how or certain kind of privileged access that it has in return for basically flattering the host or flattering the host's mm -hmm. desire to appear open and generous. Um, and as a result, it's able to eat well at the host's expense. And so what I'm interested in the book and doing in the book is kind of drawing not on the kind of necessarily the biological kind of history of the parasite, but this earlier version that is previous that, that the biological like actually is adopting um, as a metaphor and looking at this social um, status of the of the parasite as a potentially subversive mode of access um, enacted by those who can appear complicit, but where that complicity may be leveraged to certain ends. So it's someone who's invited in, someone who's allowed to stay, and someone who's not immediately perceived as a threat. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, music to my ears, and again, half of this is going into my PhD. <laughs> um, <laughs> Apologies for that joke. I'll try not to make no, it too okay. often in the, in the rest of the conversation. <laughs> but I hope this hasn't been too abstract for, for, our, for our listeners so far. And we'll get to, it, to an, another artistic example in a moment. But I want to also pay you a compliment for doing something that I think is incredibly important as a technical tool. So one of the things that your conceptualization 
of the parasite allows you to do is to bypass the kind of suspicion that artistic practices do indeed arise in the art world and in critics. And I think you do it quite consciously when you, you draw the parasitism as an alternative to critical theory approaches to those kind of artistic practices. So I was quite happy oh, yeah. to see that you also made the same joke about Audre Lorde as I have a few times attempted to make at, um, at conferences and at seminars, usually to quite severe backlash. But the very idea that the master's tools cannot, will not dismantle the master's house, which seems to be kind of a given in, in a lot of, particularly feminist thought, but in a lot of critical theory inspired art criticism and approaches to understanding um, radical politics. There's this kind of assumption that the tools of the host are somehow antithetical to political progress or to the po political aims of the guest or the parasite. And I think it's incredibly useful that your apparatus allows us to completely overcome that limitation, because otherwise I think we, we end up at a point where we can't read any of these works in, in very productive, productive ways, and we can't see them as, as possibly templates for further action. Well, I would, I would say one thing I try to think carefully about in the book is the relationship of um, parasitism to you know, Audre Lorde's master's tools thesis and right how influential that has been. And I think it's important for me to stress that I don't think that parasitism is a, a kind of tactic that it certainly isn't available equally to all, but it also isn't mm. attractive equally to all. And, it, and I talk, you know, I talk in the book about the different kinds of thresholds of, of accommodation that are available to different kinds of subjects and yep. different positionalities. And I think for kind of a radical black feminist writer that's thinking about and writing for people who are, are really kind of outside of the, of the kind of host, this is not a tactic that is um, available, really, or even if, yeah. it, if it can be desirable. And I think that's still the case. But I do try to think about what I'm doing um, as less reject kind of that thesis than um, try to find a submerged possibility within it. And I do think the idea that complicity is anathema to um, any form of resistance has kind of kept us paralyzed or, or paralyzed yeah. certain forms of action or made it so that we can't see certain kinds of work as doing anything. And so that's where I'm trying to kind of loosen something and find some leverage. Um, but I all, all the while holding the kind of difficult political compromises that are ha have to be made and also compromised positions that the subjects that are able to do that are already in. So I wonder whether we could take it now to a slightly more concrete example. We've talked, we've talked a little bit about the concept. Let's look at an artist who's dear to my heart because I've, um, I know her, I've exhibited her in my former gallery, and I'm talking about Nouria Guel, uh, who is a Catalan mm -hmm. artist who works at the margins of political and legal systems and administrative systems, and I've been, I was so happy to see how much attention you paid to her work. I wasn't aware that anyone had written so much about her before. So maybe I'll ask you to, to introduce why you came to be interested in her and what, what it is that she does as a, as a parasite. So yeah, Nardia Goel, um, I was really super excited to discover her work. And so in her work, um, there is um, kind of no space in the law. So she, she, the works that I look at are works in which she's really interested in um, citizenship. And the problems associated with citizenship, that's kind of what I'm focusing on in the chapter that I um, have on her. And, and she's really troubled by the fact that there's no space in the law for not being hosted, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> for, for not being hosted by a nation um, um, or not being a citizen. And her politics, which are very, um, as you know, kind of associated with an anarchist politics and kind of community, are very much against yeah. this essentially this forced complicity with the imperial project of the European state of Spain. Um, so in Stateless by Choice, this um, one work that I kind of start with, she attempts to renounce her Spanish citizenship in solidarity with migrants, only to find that if you go to all the offices and fill out all the forms and go to all the lawyers, it's, it's, it's legally impossible. Yeah. And so from there, I pivot, and she pivots really, I, I follow her so that when these, these attempts kind of to escape the host fail, right, frontally, 
to escape the host. When they fail, she turns to kind of undertake what I consider to be a more parasitical route, which is to basically try to use her own citizenship essentially as a siphon um, for redistribution to others. Um, and here I'm in the chapter really kind of comparing this, this strategy around citizenship to work that Kenneth Pietrobano has done with private property, where I see him using private property in a similar way as to kind of create a, a siphon. Ultimately, I spend the most time looking at her irreverently titled um, work, Humanitarian Aid, in which she held a contest to marry a Cuban man who wished to immigrate to Spain. And that was a project that sought to use loveless marriage, um, kind of fascinatingly enough, as a siphon, as many have, as a siphon for <laughs> redistributing the yeah. privilege associated with European citizenship. So, you know, marriage with all of its kind of um, privilege is the possibility of of kind of extending something um, like nationality. And of course, the work um, is, you know, very complex. And I talk about how it's very status as art, as a public kind of performance and its documentation and exhibition, you know, raises a lot of difficult questions about who the parasite is and who the host is in that yeah. relationship. And in, in the sense that the work itself seems to kind of put her spouse, um, the parasite's parasite, so to speak, at risk um, to some degree in a venture that would maybe um, be most um, successful if it was kept secret while potentially posing kind of less risk to her. Um, but this is just kind of a way of trying to think through the kind of complications and kind of complicated effects of this tactic as I do throughout the book. And, you know, after living in Spain for a year, um, it seemed that her husband couldn't find work, kind of making him more dependent on her. So it's a really fascinating work. And um, and that's kind of some of the things I'm looking at. Yeah, and I think that's a brilliant example because it exposes the, the kind of relatively low threshold. And threshold is a term that you develop. But I think there's a bunch of questions that come up from this shift of scale. If we started with Amazon Noir, which is you know, maybe a little bit abstract in its scale, it, what Nuria does is so small and so modest that one wants to ask what it is that is special about her as an artist being able to perform such action. So that's mm -hmm. one thing. And the second, how we judge this action, what are, what, are, what are the criteria for its success? Is it that mm -hmm. she goes undetected? Is it that the work is treated as a work on aesthetic terms and you know, end as a museum collection, therefore being presented as a as an example, is it that the state closes in the loophole as it might well want mm -hmm. to? So I want to ask you to, to discuss a little bit some of the, the limitations and some of the, the categories that we might have to consider as we, as we go through this. Yeah, I mean, uh, let me maybe start by saying something more about the loophole and then kind of get at this really hard question, um, of, I think, of scalability, but also of, um, of when success actually is a or when, yeah, when basically the success of the tactic actually um, closes the tactic for others. In other words, is a kind of failure long-term. Um, so yeah, loophole is um, a t another term I kind of briefly develop in the chapter um, on Pietro Bono and Guell. And um, it's, loophole is another name for this kind of play or the space for maneuver inside of systems, the play in the system. Um, and I'm interested, I was interested to kind of learn that originally the loophole was, um, I didn't know this, but it was a small architectural aperture <laughs> in a medieval castle. Did you know that? Um, no, I didn't. It, your, your, yeah, your book is informative in many more ways yeah, than, than, you know? than I anticipated. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're learning about medieval castles now. Um, yeah. yeah, and so it, it was made, um, you know, it, so the, that kind of aperture in the castle wall, you know, made it open ever so slightly to the outside as a way, you know, to defend itself. But by this very token, it was also not immune from attacks um, from the outside, but it was obviously much harder, you know, for an arrow to get in. So for me, the loophole kind of materializes this really narrow space that powerful systems and entities um, really must leave open so that they can operate in some way. Um, you know, the kind of um, give essentially in the system that kind of is necessary for it to to, to function. Um, and so the kind of loopholes are, are kind of parasitical plays for resistance I discuss in the book take different forms. 
right? Like at the beginning, you know, we talked about Amazon Noir. So sometimes it's a corporate platform's desire to appear inviting, you know, have you, you know, peruse the book to seem like it, you know, is engaging in forms of open access um, to the public. Sometimes it's, you know, the fine print of contractual language that has yet to be closed. Um, so the possibility that, you know, that a loving marriage can, you know, pass or a loveless marriage can pass as a loving marriage and then someone can get a citizenship that they would otherwise be denied. You know, I think this is really where we get to the truly the difficulty of this of this figure in terms of your question about how we know if it's successful. What are the metrics mm-hmm. of success and failure of of the parasite? And how do we critique the parasite? How do we um, you know, think about its political and ethical kind of efficacy? And I think I spend a lot of time trying to think through that. And I think, you know, maybe I can just kind of start to answer that by thinking with you about your question about scalability. Mm-hmm. Um I wouldn't say that Nerdy Aguel's work is just symbolic, um, because I think it does have a material effect, um, but that the longer effects of that, we can't anticipate them. I really am not cynical about it. I think it, it can do something and it can have a kind of consequence. But I also think that what we have to deal with is the fact that that's not final and it, it kind of goes on and it's dynamic. And I also think that that effect is not not, not necessarily scalable. And that's also mm-hmm. kind of a, an essential feature of the parasite, right? Like if we're thinking about at least scaling something like an act like, you know, that up, you know, may, say marriage, um, the use of marriage as a siphon for citizenship, which of course it is used on a collective scale widely. But if it was seen by the state as doing that, it would likely trigger a reaction from the state. It would yeah. precisely close the loophole, as you were saying. So I think here is when art's ambiguities is kind of key, mm-hmm. right? And the fact that art is, it can be political, but it's not, it's not political action per se, right? So if people were doing that and it couldn't, and they couldn't claim kind of the alibi of art, it would, it would likely trigger this kind of immunitarian response yeah. from all kinds of powerful entities. So, and maybe here there's something interesting to say about scalability in the language of capital, because I know Anna Singh has talked about scalability as a project of replicating yeah. without replicating a project without changing a frame. And what is maybe valuable about these works and you know the work that we're talking about specifically is not that it's offering a performance or a kind of act that is readily scalable, right? But you know, the point is that it's not immediately clear to the host that it's a threat. And because of that, it, it's kind of seen as a minor threat, and therefore it's not yeah. closed. So in a way, there's a paradox. Kind of it can't work too well in order to work, at least according to a certain kind of capitalist logic of work. Mm, that's incredibly interesting and actually something that I've been scratching my head about. You know, the idea of scale is one, but, but the very definition of the impact that artistic practices can have on the systems with which they interact is is completely moot. And I guess it's the saying that Noria is trained, or at least comes from the tradition of Arte Util, which is a you know, system or other way of thinking about art's usefulness that was pioneered by the Cuban artist Tanya Bruguera. And as I was reading the book, I was just trying to think about how your parasites can do a bunch of different things that allow it to to still claim impact beyond even the idea of scale. So first, the parasite can just kind of sit on top of its host and, you know, occasionally just get a free ride. That's that's sort of what maybe seems to happen when in Nuria's work, where we take away the symbolic aspect. The parasite can steal from from its host. That's what Amazon Noir seems seems to have done. Or in the kind of set of practices that I'm most interested in, my own research, is that the parasite could try to change its host, change its ways. Now, the way that you, I think, quite rightly point out that the change most frequently is that the host just closes down a loophole because that's the easiest thing for it to do. But we have access to so many elaborate and kind of high volume, high resources artistic practices these days, or at the very least, the kind of practices that I look at, forensic architecture, for instance, being one of them, I've also had on a podcast a few months ago. These are big practices that claim to make quite significant change to their environment at an epistemic and disciplinary level. One of the most helpful tools or or sort of resources that I had when I was trying to kind of develop my own kind of understanding of the parasite and the and it's and what it does was um, 
Michel, you know, the French um, kind of philosopher who recently passed away um, last year, his famous, you know, book, um, Parasite, The Parasite, he talks about uh, what you were saying before made me think of what he describes the parasite as a thermal exciter of a system. And, you know, he, he talks about how it's, you know, it's not radically kind of changing the system, but it can slowly mm. and incrementally and not in a kind of reformist way, but it can sort of, um, it can really change the climate of, yeah. of its host environment. And so for me, it was really very helpful to think about the way that, you know, that there's a kind of, a sh I think in most of these artworks, there's, there's this way in which they seem to be mirroring or kind of um, miming or fitting in quite nicely at first um, with their, their host. And they seem to be, you know, following their rules, working well within them. But there's an incremental to the point of being kind of slow, indecipherable, this kind of slow shift where the kind of parasite slowly reveals itself mm -hmm. to the host as alterity, as, as actually, um, a, you know, a threat, even if it's a minor threat. And I think it's the way that that is revealed that is really key to the, the way that I'm understanding the work of the parasite in the book. You know, Sarah explains that the way that this works in the biological sense is that the biological parasite neutralizes the host, its standard net mechanisms for rejecting potential threats mm -hmm. by, you know, basically secreting a kind of tissue that's identical to the host. So I think it's by making the kind of host feel comfortable with the parasite that the parasite then does its work by stabbing it in the back, so to speak, but at a point where the host kind of has to still deal with it and can't let it go because it's got, it's kind of um, stunned the host defenses by that point. That's why I really focus on a certain kind of subset of, of parasites. Um, and they tend to be the most adept at performing a certain complicity with power, with um, often whiteness, often masculinity. Um, it's really the kind of, and you mentioned the thresholds. So it's really this mm -hmm. kind of certain kind of, of subject who can not only, you know, be tolerated or endured by the host system, but can, you know, take. And I think for them to really take and get away with it, it tends to be figures that, that are desired by the host or um, where there's a, a kind of investment, a special kind of investment. Um, so I think that's why I tend to end up looking at um, performances by women and a particular relationship of, um, of a certain kind of um, really kind of figure that is deeply kind of understands what it means to work within complicity. What kind of space do you think the artist is afforded within this, this framework? Yeah. So this question about the status of the artist in the book, I kind of talk about how the artist has always been parasitical. The mm. role of the artist has always been parasitical. Um, and I, you know, explore the long history of this kind of special place at the table, so to speak, that the artist has and, you know, kind of what makes it an exemplary parasite, which, you know, has to do with the way that it's always kind of been compromised by virtue of its need to be able to survive within a certain kind of economy of patronage and consumption. That's one way that art's working. And then the other way is the way that kind of art, and I think technology too, and performance, they all kind of have key functions in the ability for the parasite to be able to enact a certain form of resistance without being shoved down by the host. And that has to do with the host being a little stunned or confused mm -hmm. um, for, you know, about what the the nature of this display is, is it, there's a, and I think that there's a certain kind of deniability that's built into whether it be kind of digital technology or art or performance that is really key. Yeah. And I think one of, one of the things that, that, that has come to my mind quite often think about these issues is that this kind of parasitism destabilizes very easy understandings of what the artist politics really is. I think mm -hmm. one of the threats of these kind of activities, apart from the fact that they are maybe maybe more susceptible to appropriation by capital and neoliberalism than, than many other artistic uh, types of artistic politics, it becomes very difficult to be sure that the artist has the right, in scare quotes, politics to them. And I'm, I want to use that as a segue to, to another one of your examples, which changes scale and changes, changes direction. And I'm talking about Chris Krauss, I Love Dick, the novel which mm -hmm. you note was not necessarily well received um, when it came out, and it was read as a kind of horrifying or degrading memoir. But I was particularly interested in seeing how you bring 
a lot of the feminist ideas, how a lot of kind of working from inside the system, which I guess, I guess takes us a little bit further into this whole model of parasitism. So I wonder if we could mm -hmm. talk a little bit about I Love Dick and why Chris Krauss is also a parasite. Sure, yeah, that's great. The book is a kind of cult novel that, when it came out in the 90s, really was, yeah, it was befuddling for particularly kind of feminist critics who couldn't understand why this person was portraying herself in this incredibly kind of abject way that seemed to be mm. the opposite of certain kind of feminist comportment. So the book is a series of, of love letters, kind of diaristic letters written to um, Dick, and in which a character named Chris Krause, um, same name as the author, you know, purported to be deeply and madly in love with Dick, um, who she'd only met kind of briefly through her husband, Sylvia Lantrager, who recently passed, and the character of Chris Krause's character, her husband, is also named Sylvia Lantrager. So we're invited to be confused by the possibilities of um, this not being fiction, but being real. And we are told over and over again that mm. the love is real that she has for Dick. And this is a book that's been really reevaluated, re you know, critically. It's been really yep. heralded as a kind of feminist anthem that published kind of too early for its moment and is really interestingly really anticipates you know a lot of stuff around me too and a, a lot about the public truth telling of private actions of public figures and so forth yeah i mean i think to kind of return to your question and what i think is kind of at the heart of your question is this um relationship of the parasite to feminism and in the the complex relationship that feminism has to parasitism and and that's something that I think um, I understood kind of that book to be really exploring in really fascinating ways really early on. And I can talk a little bit about the special relationship of feminism to parasitism and also really difficult relationship um, a bit. And, and that may be a way of getting back into mm -hmm. I Love Dickens, some of the things that it's doing. Obviously, well, maybe it's not obvious, but parasitism, mm -hmm. you know, in its kind of biological sense, kind of describes a relationship where an organism depends on a host for its survival, right? So the kind of relation of structural dependence is, well, it's a perennial feminist concern. And it's one in the book I talk about is um, really kind of made um, even more kind of pervasive by a neoliberal present in which dependency on kind of corporate and state structures is increasingly generalized. But feminism, and particularly, uh, and, and this is particularly pronounced in a a certain strand of second wave feminism, and I talk about this in the third chapter, um, in a particularly kind of white Western European feminist struggle that is very much within a heterosexual matrix mm -hmm. that has super struggled historically against its own kind of internalized complicity with basically patriarchy, right? Like it's kind of dependent or secondary or supplementary status of women and sexual and kind of racial minorities on pat heteropatriarchy and white heteropatriarchy. So this is something that that book is really staging in this kind of professed love for um, Dick, you know, Dick being the member, right? The kind of um, the, the, the symbol, symbol of patriarchal power. And, and, I th and ultimately, I argue in the book that it's through this really manic writing of these letters that avow that kind of like claimed love for Dick is actually um, really subverted. and. Mm -hmm. You know, Dick is really, he becomes, you know, obviously the object of a really intense scrutiny and this claim of love. Love is sort of transmuted into this kind of um, threat that and, and, and where it becomes clear that it's not about any individual man, but it's very much about her working through her own sense of professional kind of abjection and her own sense of, yeah, and romantic abjection. And it's very much about kind of working through some of these, I think some of these kind of like concerns of, of being precarious and dependent on both her husband and on this kind of um, projected onto Dick. So mm, and, and this, is, this is super interesting. And I think it's, it's a beautiful example in a book of the kind of obsessive dedication that the parasite has to bring to its host to be able to get anything other than the surface. I mean, you, you described Krauss's um, or her character's approach to to dick as as that of a troll as a kind of a gorilla i mean it's she yeah. essentially invents the online troll and kind of spam 
10 years before it, it eventuates in, in, in the public public sphere. And, and I think you also rightly point out that actually we have quite a lot of histories of that within feminism, like the, the suffragette and suffragist movement to, to a certain arguable extent has some of those features. But let's move to another historical figure, albeit a living one. You devote the best part of a chapter to Marina Abramovich and to a range of reactions by younger artists to the status of who Marina Abramovich is. I mean, it wouldn't be silly to say that Marina Abramovich is the Wikipedia entry for a certain genre of performance art, which in and of itself becomes quite a, quite a challenge for artists who follow in her footsteps to contend with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, here's where we see also the kind of changing position of the host. I've described it as like, um, you know, the kind of corporate entity. I've described it as the, the neoliberal state um, that is, you know, welcoming and then not so welcoming. And then I've described it as the kind of dick, right? The the symbol of kind of patriarchy. Mm. And here's where we see somebody like Abramovic kind of take the seat as the host, which she literally does in her 2010 Momo retrospective. Um, that is such a massive touchstone in, in terms of kind of the history of performance art. And that is, you know, both the retrospective and the durational performance that she did um, called The Artist is Present. And so I kind of, in the fourth chapter, take that performance where she's seated and she's sitting across from others and welcoming them to sit um, with her as a kind of starting point to think through a, a kind of um, relationship of a certain um generation of performance art that has tended to be really artists uh, like Abramovic um, and other, you know, Karen Finley, other major performance artists that are artists that were kind of coming of age in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and their relationship to a younger generation of performance artists that I'm writing about who are trying to basically make their name in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis mm -hmm. and in a moment in which it really feels like Abramovic has become a symbol as you were kind of gesturing toward of the door being closed on um, new mm. and, and funding of, of younger artists and younger kind of performance works and, and where those artists are really struggling to find their place at the table. So unless they're coming as a guest um, to sit with Abramovic and kind of um, marvel at her, at her uh, body of work. And so, you know, what is behind a lot of that is um, Abramovic's um, pioneering and advocating of um, what she calls reperformance, which is where these artists are invited as part of that retrospective to, uh, and, and really beyond to, to uh, reenact her work. Um, so she, you know, rather than doing all of her, a kind of original work. She hired young, these younger artists as part of the MoMA did um, to reenact those works and they were paid and they were paid very little and there were various kinds of labor concerns. And so in that chapter, this is all to say that I, you know, am thinking about uh, a really kind of fraught generational relationship between the Abramovic of generation, but specifically Abramovic herself, because I don't think that her generation of artists are all necessarily bearing the same relationship to these younger mm -hmm. artists. And, you know, I kind of um, am countering Abramovic with an artist like Anne Liv Young, who's a New York-based performance artist and former dancer, um, you know, who is, along with others, kind of referencing or reproducing well-known works without quoting them. Um, so she's, you know, um, referencing the artist is present in a work of her own, but it's very kind of ironic. Um, and it's a kind of tacit reference without claiming to actually know Abramovic and Lib Young's um, kind of alter ego claims to have never heard of her while at the same time re referencing her. So I'm really interested in these artists kind of strategies and I, I describe them as kind of parasitical homages that are very much, I think, critiquing kind of the tacit kind of narratives of meritocracy, um, you know, that one can gain a seat at the table if they're just original and wait their turn. And trying to think through um, the ways that these younger artists are trying to find a place and, and trying to find a position that they can kind of occupy in this really winner take all art market at the time, mm -hmm. when it's kind of become clear that the position occupied by kind of pioneers of this radical tradition have been completely reified. Um, and it doesn't leave a lot of space for these artists to intervene. So, yeah, you know, so. what this kind of shows is the the shifting kind of labile position of the parasite and how shifting that landscape can be. And 
And it's not just about being critical of Abramovic and kind of pointing at her, but I also in the chapter sort of develop parasites or younger artists even than Young and others who are actually, uh, there's a, another artist, um, Lauren Barry Holstein, who has done some similar things with um, Anne Liv Young in terms of there have been kind of critiques that she is referencing and kind of using some of her work. So it becomes actually ultimately in that chapter an opportunity to kind of think about how one can at the same time be a host and a parasite and how it's kind of both a function of one's place in the social ladder, but also kind of a matter of time. Um, and how kind of radically historically subjective and shifting this 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 kind of role is. And I really recommend this chapter in particular to to any young artist or artist trying to contend with these kind of histories by going over the examples of some of younger artists who pretend to be replicating some of Abramovich's ideas at some point completely mm -hmm. disavow feminism at some point you know drive themselves into what you describe as other adolescent parody. I think this is a super interesting moment where the, the logic of the parasite possibly breaks down. And I would also possibly question whether whether the art world itself is a particularly fruitful space for artists to, to place their energies as parasites. And I, I wanted to take that question over to maybe the last example of your book, which hopefully will explain why I've been suggesting plagiarism. <laughs> and I have to pay you a compliment, Anna, because... 200 pages into any theory book, one gets a little bit sleepy and you have structured this particular <laughs> story, maybe through, through the stroke of luck that, that, you know, that you developed your own parasite on, on the side. But it really, it really made reading to the last page incredibly rewarding. So Russian Burn in, in, the, in the 2000s, as she was studying and practicing, I think, at Goldsmiths in London, got into the mm -hmm. habit of simply replicating the practices of her tutors. Um, eventually ended up, I think, stealing a piece of work from the Turner Prize winning artist, Simon yes. Starling. And she just did this over and over and over again. And your particular engagement with her involves a bit of correspondence and then using without any authorization a piece of your writing as a press release. And in a way, it should have been predictable, as you acknowledge yourself, should have been clear to you from day one that would happen. She went on to just mistreat you a little bit the same way that she mistreated everyone else. Yeah, and you were also mentioning the moment when almost parasitism seems to become kind of harnessed in a way that is out of control or almost seems to exceed mm. sort of the the critic's grasp. And I think that this is a nice kind of segue into talking about Roisin Byrne because that's really the limit case of the book, you know, that yeah. I end with. The book is starting with really kind of more immediately recognizable or at least reassuring examples of parasitical resistance. Yeah. I think few would contest Amazon's kind of monopolistic hold on us. But as the chapters are developing, there are more and more moments like this when, you know, as you were saying about these younger artists in the um, fourth chapter, when tactics of the parasite can at least it can exceed my grasp as a critic who's trying to at least begin from a place where there's a kind of coherence to the parasite and potentially a kind of resistant politics, one that can't be taken for granted, but where potentially there can be a kind of legible form of resistance at work. But, you know, as I was writing the book, you know, a number of the artists that I was writing about, Chris Krauss, Anne Liv Young, some, and some others, and certainly Byrne, Roisin Byrne, who I end with, began to really engage with the criticism. Um, they began to kind of speak back mm -hmm. and respond to, and at times even contest and even plagiarize ultimately with Burn, what were previously published works um, that I had put out in the course of writing the book and the characterizations in that, in that writing of their work as parasitical. So things started to get really, really interesting. And that's where criticism and art were really kind of like deeply in dialogue. Um, and this culminated, I think, as you were kind of referencing, um, in, a coda, um, in a coda where I share uh, uh, kind of the chain of events um, that that um, took place, um, whereby Roisin Byrne began to essentially steal and forge my scholarship on her parasitical art practice. <laughs> uh, so um, when I had begun to write about Byrne as a grad student, I was still, you know, very naive, and I was still um, kind of thinking about her work in a feminist frame that was really not very intersectional and not very complicated. 
And what these moments, and this is kind of what I talk about in the coda, these moments um, where she's snapping back and kind of parasiting back on the, the parasitical criticism, um, what they did was they kind of forced me to recognize my own attempt to control what this parasite is and what it can do. <laughs> And then sort of the way in which these artists particularly make it very difficult to do that. And in fact, it's like, I think a part, a really important part of the parasite itself is it, it cannot be controlled and it's out and its outcomes cannot, they are not simple and they happen over time and they are dynamic and, and it's, you know, not really possible always to manage or suppress or redirect what can at times be the parasites um, kind of unethical or even volatile charge, right? And we see that in the book, throughout the book, the parasite, even as a kind of almost as a matter of course, it can lose its ground, it can become co-opted, and it's a messy figure. And it's one that doesn't always play kind of by neat kind of critical or political rules, even though I, you know, see there is a lot of potential you know, and a lot of symbolic power and even some kind of um, material kind of effects. It's a tricky thing because it can be, um, it is often short-lived and it is often unpredictable. And I think this is super interesting because like the art world doesn't have much of a sense of humor about this. The same way that the literary world didn't particularly have much of a sense of humor about Chris Krauss. It's very difficult to predict how the hegemonic system to which the parasite attaches itself is going to tolerate whatever it is trying to do. And the, the question that fascinates me in all of this more than anything else, I think, is the question of the ethics of the parasite. Again, the parasite's politics may not be assumed to be in line with the predicaments or the predictions or the desires of radical politics or critical theory. I mean, there could be a, a reading in which Russian burn is simply a kleptomaniac who's unwell. Mm -hmm. We have to accommodate for the fact that we cannot predict that she will do anything great with that particular theft. There's no guarantee that they will necessarily lead us into any kind of great systemic enhancement for all. Absolutely. That's all very well put. Yeah, I think this is an incredibly important question. So you having been the host on which the parasite has fed, did you feel... Did you feel abused? Did you feel that this was there was a threshold that was reached and overstepped that made the whole interaction valuable, not just for you but for the world <laughs> that was observing it? Yeah. Um, ultimately, I, I certainly did not feel mistreated. Um, <laughs> I think <laughs> there was trepidation at the beginning because I, you know, was a grad graduate student who was concerned about an unpublished piece of work, but there is absolutely no doubt that this was a dance ultimately that served my interests and at the time served her interests. You know, so I think, you know, ending there is a way of kind of also complicating what begins with Amazon and, you know, a little guy and then end with a situation between an artist and a critic that are basically the same age in similar places in terms of their careers and where who the host is and who the parasite is between the artist and the critic is quite undecidable in moments. Um, so there were moments in which where she was, you know, there was a sense of a threat. And then there were moments in which, you know, I was, you know, absolutely using that parasitism and it was fortifying. So I think that ends up being a kind of opportunity to, yes, to both kind of complicate the, the dynamic between the parasite when they're not actually gigantic and powerful and violent kind of entity versus a little guy. Um, but when the differential is quite um, subjective. And I will say, you know, ultimately, the way that I end is having come to um, the conclusion that actually Byrne is no longer a working artist and not being able to contact her anymore. Mm. So where that di dialogue actually ends, and it is really to then reflect on the kind of system in which parasites can continue to, to live and in, in which in, in a system in which they are always kind of ultimately, even though they may have moments of uh, getting an upper hand, I mean, they're always pretty vulnerable. And so an artist who is so opportunistic and so kind of ingenious in various ways, it, it's ultimately, I think, a kind of a sad note to end on it, that it's not still not kind of possible. I mean, I don't know what the reasons are that she may no longer be working. It doesn't have to be the market, but um, there is a kind of, I think, melancholy tone. And, 
you know, and to end on and, you know, where there's a world in which the art market is just too fierce. In the kind of when I'm concluding the introduction, I'm really having to kind of grapple with this really important question. I think that you've asked in a couple of different ways. So what do you do about the sort of like untamability of of certain parasites and when they aren't necessarily going to serve the interests of critical theory or of a certain kind of leftist politics? And I think for me, ultimately, writing this as a, you know, as a critic, it's important for there to be some ways of thinking about this work so it doesn't kind of devolve into chaos. And, you know, those two kind of measures, I think, if I'm, you know, as someone who is invested in a certain kind of um, form of resistance, but in a leftist politics, which is, you know, the question of whether the work is re- truly redistributive, um, even mm-hmm. if it's minorly redistributive, I think that that's one kind of question to pose about the work and redistributive in a sense that has an overall kind of impact, um, yeah. which is obviously hard to, to calculate um, if, it not, if not impossible. But then the other would just be the kind of charge of it. It's the work's critical charge. And I think that that's, those are the kind of measures that I'm trying to take of these works, um, even as I also am very interested in the ways that they can not live up to those things and, and actually go in their own way. And, and, and they don't necessarily serve the politics that I'm interested in. Well, it's not going to necessarily answer that question, but if any of our listeners know what on earth happened to Rashreen Byrne, I would love them to get in touch and tell us because she just disappeared. Well, I should say, we as, after I published the book, because it's kind of like very um, web 1.0 of me, but like I contacted her through Facebook. And obviously we're not in really... We're in a Twitter age, so the second mm. the book came out, she contacted me on Twitter, oh. um, which is kind of funny, and she was really excited about the book. It seems to be well, but I don't have the answer to that question. But um, yeah, I did. She is, I did it try turns to out post she that. is in the world. Yeah, she's in the world. Well, let's let's get her to retweet news of this interview and see see what that what happens. Um, Anna, thank you so much. Um, I will stop myself from paying you yet another compliment because I realize that I'm partly as a parasite, paying myself a compliment for having been interested in similar things to you. But I truly, truly commend this. It's a way that you open up a completely new way of thinking about pressing politics that is, I think, ever present in our inner life. It's, it's incredibly impressive. And I also know that I was so late to to ask you to, to do this interview that you have managed to write another book. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your invitation to speak today. And it's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you. And thank you for your compliments um, about the book. Um, so uh, so I recently published a very short um, new book called Safety Orange, which is, um, mm. you know, in kind of themes and, um, and focus really a departure from the play in the system, but is about this bureaucratic color standard that emerged in the U.S. in the 1950s and 60s um, that is now um, ubiquitous in the U.S. And this is a color Mm -hmm. that we see um, in traffic cones, in prison jumpsuits, in Trump, in his tan. (laughs) And and I'm really interested in the book and trying to understand this kind of wide visibility of this color and the way that it has kind of left the bureaucratic scene to kind of pervade the U.S. kind of social landscape and the very different kind of work that it does when it's protecting some and making others more vulnerable. And so it's really a kind of meditation on Safety Orange and on um, kind of the the neoliberal work of this color um, and the kind of way that it is um, used in pandemic and environmental risk indexes and is sort of um, making us hypervigilant and also at the same time teaching us to not pay attention. The Play in the System, The Art of Parasitical Resistance by Anna Watkins Fisher is published by Duke University Press and is available as an open source download. You will find links to that as well as information about the artists we discussed in the episode notes. I'm Pierre Delancey and the editor is Marshall Poe. Thank you for listening and join us next time.